now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Hi, everyone. My name is Madiha Afsal. I am a fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. And I recently published an article on persuasion titled, Biden was wrong on Afghanistan. This was a response to a compelling piece by my colleague, John Rauch, who wrote a, a piece titled, Biden was right on Afghanistan. 20 years uh, after America removed the Taliban from power, it is an agonizing outcome that in August we saw the Taliban return to power. And it's especially agonizing given the enormous costs of the war. Of course, this is US and NATO troops who lost their lives. This is money spent, but this is also the scale of the destruction and loss of life in Afghanistan, of both civilians and Afghan security forces. Many have looked at that and said, if we could not defeat the Taliban in 20 years, how could a few more months or even years make a difference? And many who think Biden was right to leave say we would have been mired in Afghanistan indefinitely. And as I mentioned earlier, my colleague John Rauch made a compelling case along those lines. And I'm sympathetic to that argument. Biden's decision was a very, very difficult one. But my argument is that the enormous cost of the war and the losses that Afghans bore and crucially continue to bear, that gave America a moral responsibility to ensure a better outcome, given the fact that we went into Afghanistan in 2001. Reckoning with that American responsibility doesn't mean that we would have had to make a decision to stay forever. I think the choice as it's presented, basically being one of staying forever and the other being that we would have to leave now, misses the third way. And the third way, I argue, was a choice to leave once an intra-Afghan peace deal that's between the Taliban and the Ghani government was reached. Of course, the intra-Afghan peace negotiations were already in process, and the two ways Biden could have ensured this were A, either to renegotiate the Doha deal with the Taliban to make withdrawal explicitly conditional on an intra-Afghan peace deal, or starting 2021, January, when he came into office, put maximum pressure on the Taliban and the Ghani government to compromise and focus all our energies on that. That compromise should have ensured two basic things. One, for Afghan women and girls to retain their basic rights to an education and to work, rights that are now gravely compromised. And two, for Afghanistan to have an economy that functions at a basic level so that Afghans can have food to eat. Right now, they're on the brink of starvation. And so my argument is that any power sharing agreement that we could have pushed through would have been better than the current outcome where the Taliban rule Afghanistan unchecked. And of course, there's no guarantee that this would have worked, but we owed Afghans a try. We owed them a better attempt at this. Medea Afsal's piece called Biden Was Wrong on Afghanistan was published by Persuasion. To learn more about the community we're building at Persuasion and to get similar articles directly into your inbox, head to www.persuasion.community. My guest today is Michael Powell. Michael has long been a reporter for the New York Times, He's now a national reporter who covers a lot of the strange sociocultural transformations of the country and especially the country's elite that are currently going on. He has written about the ACLU. He has written about private schools. He has written about some of the strange things going on at elite universities from Smith to MIT. I really wanted to have this conversation to get an on-the-ground look from somebody who is dispassionate, but also very insightful and witty about what is going on in the elite institutions of this country. I feel like I got a much better sense of what is happening at this moment than I did before the conversation. I hope you'll enjoy the conversation for the same reason. Michael Powell, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. 
So I've really been enjoying your reports from around the country. And I thought that you might be able to help me with something that I've been struggling about, which I've been thinking through, which is that every time you get a story about an attack on liberalism, and part from the right, but also from the left, it is dismissed by partisans as you know, this is just a crazy story. You're just nitpicking the most extreme examples. This really isn't a broad phenomenon going on in the country. So I guess I wanted to get your sense of, are all of these stories that you've been writing about, on the right and on the left, in, in different parts of the country, in academia, but also outside of academia, do they add up to a bigger picture? Yeah, that's a great question. And I guess out of self-interest, but also because I truly believe it, I think the answer is almost certainly yes. Some time ago, I guess it was about seven months ago, I did a story on a particular case at Smith College, an elite liberal arts school in Massachusetts. And for that, I spoke to, oh, I don't know, must have been at least 15 faculty, of whom all of them tenured. I think, as I recall, three of them went on the record, with perhaps one exception, none disputed that there was an illiberal stream running through liberal higher education these days, and specifically at their school. And then I should say almost all had particular tales to tell, not all hair curling, not, you know, these were not people being cast into the wilderness, but it was quite striking that I'm talking to, in almost all cases, senior tenured faculty, and none were willing to go on. People who are untenured, I very much understood, and they wouldn't go near talking on the record. And I, I thought to myself, well, you know, this is a fine liberal institution, an elite liberal institution, and this isn't good. And it was interesting after the piece appeared, it was on a particular racial incident at Smith, the president, as I expected might happen, you know, denounced the piece, denounced me, and went to a faculty meeting. And I had one of the faculty members call me a few hours afterwards, and she was chuckling, and she said, well, <laughs> you'll know that, you know, and she named a number of people who stood up and denounced the piece, and several of those were people I had talked to who had given me, you know, kind of chapter and verse on the problems that the university was running into on these very issues. So I took that as a... <laughs> I guess I took that as a bad sign uh, on this kind of the state of health at many of these institutions. I mean, this is the thing that strikes me about my experience in the States today versus 10 or 12 years ago when I arrived, but also about the contrast between America and, and Europe. I mean, I remember feeling when I was doing my PhD at Harvard that there was people with very different political views within the graduate student body and within the faculty at the time, and that they didn't feel constrained in expressing their opinion. And those weren't bigoted opinions, they weren't terrible opinions. People had significant disagreements with each other, but I didn't feel that people were afraid to speak out. I've been really struck being back in Europe for a few months, but I haven't had anybody say to me in those months, uh, you know, of course, I would never say this publicly. And I suddenly realized that this is a phrase that I now hear more or less every day in the United States. Again, often from people who are very much on the left, who are very progressive, who supported Bernie Sanders, who are deeply engaged in the fight against discrimination and so on. And yet there are positions that are perfectly reasonable that they would be afraid to say it publicly. So when did you start feeling that kind of cultural transition? I mean, how is it possible that in a free country, you know, these professors are telling you what the college you did was terrible and an embarrassment, and then they have to stand up in front of a colleagues and denounce a piece that describes that. It's a great question. And I've only started really writing on this in the last, I guess, year and a half. However, having said that, I mean, I'm <laughs> number one, of course, part of our culture. And it's interesting, I was writing a sports column, actually, for about four or five years before this. I mean, I'm kind of bounced all over the place. and. You know, the Times being the Times, I mean, it's a sports column in which you can write about, you know, all sorts of social issues as well. And I started to come across this when I was looking at Title IX abuses, which were, you know, frankly, in some cases quite spectacular. And 
I was struck that in doing that reporting, and so now this is casting back four or five years, I was running into the same problem that lawyers handling the cases were perfectly willing to talk to me. But when I would try to talk with professors and others on college campuses, people were very leery of it. Feminists were leery of it. And I should say with some spectacular exceptions. I mean, there are people who have been very forthright on this question, that is from the liberal feminist community. Without a doubt, again, it just feels to me this is a stream that runs quite strong through our culture right now, and not simply at universities and colleges. But of course, that's where it sometimes most obviously manifests itself. This episode is brought to you by Rad Power Bikes, designed to be a blast to ride and good for the environment. Rad Power Bikes have affordable e-bikes for every kind of rider. Get this year's must-have holiday gift at radpowerbikes.com. So let's go into a few of these different cases. And your work covers a broad range of issues, and I want to do justice to that. So I understand you're currently in Texas reporting on some of the so-called anti-CRT laws. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of what's going on there and what you're covering at the moment? Sure. Texas, as has been true in about eight, nine other states, enacted last spring several laws that ostensibly that set lines for how public school teachers, this is now in Texas, it's not higher ed, it's A to 12, what they can talk about. And it's actually, it's a little more chilling than that because it doesn't say, for instance, you can talk about the real history of the Alamo in Texas. You can talk about, theoretically, how the Texas Rangers lynched Mexicans, which happened with tragic frequency here for quite a while. You can talk about that, but the law says that you can't make children feel uncomfortable. I mean, in this way, it's a funhouse mirror of some of the stuff that you see on the left. So you can't make children feel uncomfortable, in this case, say, white children. Well, you know, I've I've talked with a lot of teachers down here, that is public school, you know, high school, middle school, social studies teachers mainly, and they talk about, you know, I mean, look, if you're going to, as we know, if you're going to talk about history, you know, let's put, in a sense, the CRT just off to the side. If you're going to wrestle with history and all of its glories and unpleasantness and messiness, you run the imminent risk at any time that you're going to make a student uncomfortable or upset, not personally, right? I mean, and I think that's where it gets difficult, but just because it's difficult stuff to handle. And well, right now, theoretically, a teacher who does that and where a couple of students or parents were to complain, literally could run the risk of losing their teacher's license. Similarly, you have librarians who are very worried because lists have been put out on books. And this is not in the law, but there's been a couple of legislators who put out these very long list of books, you know, on all manner of things. I mean, everything from race to the Holocaust to whatever. And people are just very, very worried. It's a bad place for free inquiry right now. I know you're not sort of primarily an education reporter, but what can you tell us about what is actually taught about issues like race in public schools across the United States? It's so difficult to talk about this because the local control is so strong in America that, you know, what you're likely to be taught in a school district in New York City is so different from what you're likely to be taught in a school district in Alabama. And then, of course, teachers have tremendous agency as well. So even what you might see within one classroom, within the same school, within the same school district within, say, Alabama might be completely different from what you might see in a classroom in the same school, in the same school district with another teacher. Do you feel like there's a sense of this? Because I think sometimes in the public debate, there's these sort of two sides, where on the one side, you have supposedly no teaching at all about the history of slavery, about the history of injustice in America. And then on the other side, you have sort of all critical race theory, where it seems to me like there's a much broader distribution, but in most schools probably you do have a serious engagement with the negative aspects of American history. You have some outliers, 
where that stuff is denied and not talked about at all. But you also have some outliers where something like an applied form of critical race theory, a non-academic, non-very sophisticated sort of applied cousin of critical race theory is in fact taught, despite what a lot of the media have been telling us for the last month. Do you have a sense from your reporting on this question? Honestly, I don't. And I'm not sidestepping. I mean, I agree with you that education runs a great gamut. My own kids went to public school, both now grown, but went to public school in Brooklyn, New York. And there was a great difference between the two elementary schools they went to and the two junior high schools they went to. And even within that, as you say, often teachers have a fair degree of agency. And I would argue at some level, that's a good thing, right? I remember my younger son at one point in middle school came home in a huff because he had that rarest of beasts in Park Slope, Brooklyn, which was to say a Reaganite um, social studies teacher. And, you know, I told him, I said, look, this is great. (laughs) You're not getting exposed to much of that in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And, you know, as long as he's up for letting you disagree and debate things with him and that sort of thing, have at it. Now, as it turns out, he was not the most exceptional teacher, but I thought it was useful for him to get exposed to that. Having said all of this, I also think that there is a little bit of a sleight of hand that sometimes journalists, sometimes teachers, sometimes liberals use around CRT. It is certainly true that no one is teaching CRT theory to a seventh grade social studies class. It is also true that to some extent, a number of the teaching colleges are very much influenced by, you know, I think CRT is probably too narrow. I mean, you know, sort of anti-racism, right? I mean, everything from, you know, longstanding pedagogy to, you know, popularizers like Kendi to CRT, right? And, And that those are threads that run through many of our teaching colleges. So to some extent, you get some teachers who come out who are, you know, very much, if you will, kind of dipped in those intellectual waters. So it's more about kind of how they apply those lessons, right? And I think it is fair to say that these are important intellectual currents right now on the left, on, you know, liberal left circles. And it would be rather strange if it wasn't having some impact on teachers. So I think there's a little bit of, as you say, a sleight of hand that's done with CRT, both in the press and by, you know, more largely by left liberals. So we've covered some of the ways in which in states like Texas and with the force of the law, with the force of politics, There are real restrictions on what a public school teacher can talk about. And I think public school teachers are rightly worried about the kind of overreach and access that might lead to. What is going on in some of the more progressive spaces that you've covered at places like universities, at places like the ACLU, where it often seems to be people who are you know, actually left-wing, but perhaps not quite as left-wing, not quite in vogue with some of the recent fashions, whether you want to call it quote-unquote wokeness or critical race theory or the successor ideology or any of those other terms, who seem reluctant to speak up. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in those places. Well, to cite one recent example, I wrote on the case of this renowned physics professor, Dorian Abbott, at the University of Chicago. Now, he's one of the foremost experts on exoplanets and the formation of and theoretically the degradation of atmospheres on exoplanets. And there are all sorts of revealing analogs to what that might tell us about our own atmosphere through climate change and the kind of degradations of climate change and pollution. And so, you know, here he is kind of at the heart of a very important, one might argue, existential threat to our future. He's invited to MIT to give a quite prestigious lecture purely on the science. That's what he's talking about. And it's a public lecture. So that is, it's going to be both professors and grad students and students, but also there'll be some people from the outside world at this 
And he is also fairly outspoken in his critique of diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI as it's called, and affirmative action. His is not a blanket condemnation of it, but he has real concerns about it. I would say, I mean, in that sense, he's probably, you know, somewhere center, center right in the kind of larger sweep of American society. But, you know, certainly if you look at polls, this is a very much a mainstream dialogue. Again, that doesn't imply that it's either right or wrong, but it's actually a mainstream position, uh, not just in the country, but also among different demographic groups. So when you ask people, Pew had this question, something like, you know, should companies and universities base hiring decisions exclusively on merit, even though that might decrease their diversity? Or should they take ethnicity into account in order to boost diversity? You get majorities of, if I'm remembering this right, every demographic group, which say whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, but also African Americans, take the position that it should be merit based. So whether or not you happen to agree with his position, it is one that is in the majority in the US population as a whole and in most or all demographic subjects. Absolutely. And in fact, if you look at California, the prototypical blue state, I mean, in the last election, they turned down, voters, that is, turned down effort to reinstate affirmative action in the University of California system. And there was a strong majority of Asians and apparently a majority of Latinos as well who voted against reinstating it. And the only reason I mention that is, so in other words, this is not, if you will, a William Shockley. This is not somebody who holds extreme right-wing views. This is simply whatever one makes of his views, they're in some respects, not to insult him, but they are unremarkable. When it was announced that he was going to give a speech there, faculty and grad students really across the United States reacted with outrage. And peppered MIT, you know, which of course is one of the high churches of science education in the world, really, with all sorts of objections. How can you have this man? You know, you have a DEI policy you've put in touch. It's hypocritical to invite him. Um, This is going to be damaging. You know, in the words you often hear, this is harmful. This creates harm. And MIT, I think rather remarkably, backed down and decided they weren't going to do the lecture this year. Said, well, you know, he can come and address the faculty at some later point in time, but not with this prestigious lecture. And it was, I thought, a quite remarkable moment. And one of the things, and I think this gets to kind of the larger things that I see, is that I talked to several faculty who had gone on Twitter to denounce Abbott and say that MIT should cancel his speech. And they were remarkably strong in simply saying that, you know, there are limits. They said, well, no, no, I believe in free speech, but I believe in consequences for free speech. And that, you know, it doesn't give you a right to talk wherever you want. And perhaps I'm dating myself, but I mean, you know, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, a very, very liberal neighborhood. And free speech was kind of a holy of holies at that time. You know, it was kind of seen as the founding stone of liberal in the broadest sense of society, but also liberal in the particular way it was thought of on the Upper West Side of Manhattan at that time. It was seen as a founding stone of the civil rights movement, of the anti-war movement. It's been quite striking to hear very liberal left professors saying, "Uh uh-uh, I recognize freedom of expression, but it's a value that's predominantly been exercised by white men. There's two striking things here, I think. I mean, one is the reason why I also decided to write about this Dorian Abbott example and why I think it's worth talking about even though it's sort of one lecture and so on, is that the logic behind the cancellation of his talk essentially facilitates, you know, a kind of professional blacklist where it's not even that, you know, a professional provocateur like Mario Yiannopoulos comes to Berkeley and wants to talk there and people say, look, he's going to say these disgusting and provocative things on our campus. We don't want him to talk here. Now, I'm an absolutist about these things. And I think that nobody has a right to be invited to campus. But once somebody has invited them, you should never give in to the hackler's veto and you should make sure 
that you can have an orderly protest against the speaker, but also allow the event to go forward. But what's striking about the Abbott case was that it was him expressing his opinion in the pages of Newsweek, a national magazine, on an unrelated topic. And essentially, that was going to lead to him being unable to work as a natural scientist, to hold a lecture about physics at MIT. And that essentially would create a kind of blacklist in which people who hold views, in the case of Abbott, that are shared by a majority of Americans, cannot publicly admit to them on the pain of very serious professional consequences in fields that are not essentially political. And that, to me, is really very striking and utopian. The other thing that struck me, and you're just starting to get at that, is the reasoning of some of the people who opposed his lecture. Now, one example was Phoebe A. Cohen, who's the chair of the geosciences department at Williams College. And, you know, when you asked her what she thought the effect of this cancellation on academic debate would be, whether the academy shouldn't be, you know, a place for unfettered speech, she responded, this idea of intellectual debate and rigor as the pinnacle of intellectualism comes from a world in which white men dominate it. That's remarkable, isn't it? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and I should quickly give you a nod. You were on this before uh, my article appeared. But yes, on the one hand, I found it quite remarkable, but I also find remarkable that it's not so remarkable. You know, in other words, you do hear similar sentiments, you know, quite often now. And if you choose to hang around the disreputable neighborhood of Twitter, you also see it expressed there. But yes, we're at a remarkable moment. And of course, there was a coda to that, which was that a very prominent physicist at University of California, Berkeley, went to his colleagues and said, well, you know, this is an important moment in sort of free speech and science, and we need to invite Abbott out here to talk to us, you know, to make essentially a statement of kind of where we stand. And apparently, a you know, reasonable number of his colleagues said, pass, you know, we're not going to do that. And in fact, this professor, Dave Romps, who's heads a, you know, rather prestigious center there, ended up resigning, not as a professor, but from the center, because he just said, these are not my intellectual values around speech. The other striking thing on the topic of free speech specifically is that many of the institutions that were built around the defense of a very expansive conception of free speech and that you would think would be thriving precisely in the moment in which a defense of free speech is urgently required seem to be balking at the fight. At the ACLU in particular, there is a really roiling internal debate between people who want to live up to what the historic mission of the organization has been, and people who it seems like want to turn it into a progressive organization that will decline to defend free speech when it is offensive. This one was a story when I took on this beat that I wanted to do because I'd been hearing about this from friends for a long time. I mean, the ACLU in many ways is the perfect petri dish for this because there are terrific First Amendment attorneys there who continue to do good work, but that coexists with people in various, you know, the transgender project that publicly urged a book to be essentially banned. You know, you had after the horror in Charlottesville, which was a march of neo-Nazis that got out of control. And the ACLU had argued, again, very much consistent with its history, that the alt-right had the right to march, not obviously to commit violence, but to march. And afterwards, I mean, some 200 employees signed a really vitriolic letter denouncing the leaders of the ACLU and the ACLU put out a statement that, I mean, they debate this, but I think clearly backed off a bit, you know, and said, well, we have to take other issues under consideration if we're going to think about representing these groups in the future. And yeah, I mean, it's a remarkable moment because, again, you know, growing up in New York, you thought of the ACLU as free speech and free expression was, you know, the sine qua non of that organization. And there's very much a sense now that that's a important, but a secondary concern to some of the other issues that they're involved with. 
Yeah, I think that really is a remarkable thing, especially when those two things come in conflict. And it turns out the organization that was built to fight for an expansive conception of free speech then finds itself hamstrung. The other topic that I find really interesting, but in many ways, my next book deals with, though it is much broader in perspective and what's going on in the United States in 2021, but it does speak to those issues, is some of the ways in which attempts at putting an anti-racist education into place or attempts at dealing with race end up essentializing students and teachers. You had a really interesting story on elite private schools in New York City, but this is happening in cities around the country, trying to deal with how to teach students about racism, which is, of course, a very important thing. But in the process, seemingly essentializing racial attributes, starting off with more or less mandatory ways of dividing the student body, dividing teachers into different groups on the basis of their race, Sometimes saying in language reminiscent of Phoebe Cohen that things like rigor or things like worship of a written word are white attributes that are somehow worrying indications of white supremacy culture. And I'm obviously concerned that in the name of trying to raise awareness of racism, you actually are pushing, especially students, to identify as strongly as possible with their ethnic or racial identity and that the long-term consequences of that are not going to be progressive at all, but rather to deepen mutual mistrust and prejudice and so on. What did you find in reporting on the world of these private schools and how they're trying to tackle this topic? I think your summary is spot on. And I found the elite private schools, again, an interesting petri dish because they do kind of give a window into those at the high end of the socioeconomic scale. and. Like you, I mean, I was struck by this notion of the written word. I mean, I think of myself as a kid. I mean, the discovery of, and with the help, frankly, of public school teachers at the time, the discovery of James Baldwin, of Richard Wright, you know, Claude Brown, or what I remember, Manchild and the Promised Land. I mean, all these things. I mean, you know, the notion that we would say that the written word is the exclusive or the you know main domain of white men or women is just profoundly a historical it's in my view i mean condescending and demeans i mean just the extraordinary effusion of Zora Neale Hurston i could kind of go on and on i mean of you know black writers from india you know writers i mean there's just you know african writers chinua chebe i mean it's just to me it's sort of an extraordinary moment and it's like really you want to like give up this incredible patrimony that we all possess as humans. I think what's really striking about this is that there's, you know, often been pushed back against various forms of progressive policy under, you know, the accusation that something is reverse racism. And I think that's a really complicated charge, which may sometimes be true, but is often wrong. It's the idea that in the name of trying to make progress, you're actually starting to discriminate against white people or something like that, groups that are not historically been discriminated against. What's really striking to me about these examples is that it's not reverse racism. It's just racism, right? This is just saying black people aren't interested in intellectual rigor. Black people aren't interested in the written word. Black people aren't interested in objectivity. And that is not sort of in an attempt to overcome historical injustice, treating black people better than would be fair or in some kind of way being sort of overly complimentary of them, it is in the name of anti-racism ascribing an intellectual deficit to Black people in a way that, in my mind, is and will always remain just straightforwardly racist. Yeah, well, I mean, that's <laughs> that's certainly an argument that is made against these sort of approaches. And I think we live in a moment when certainly in like those private schools, but you also start to see it now in corporate settings as well. This notion that folks should be divided into affinity groups, the better to wrestle with the particularities of their race, which of course is a social construct to begin with. All of the schools actually I looked at, that is, and these were all in Manhattan and very elite schools, roughly 60 grand a year private schools. You know, I mean, the white kids and faculty are heard into room, you know, to talk about so-called white problems. I mean, you know, I went to a private school for two years as a 
scholarship kid, and I'm a white guy. I felt, you know, very much kind of apart. This was a very financially elite student body. So, I mean, I understand, you know, there's going to be a natural desire at times to, you know, if you're one of the few, let's say, black kids at a predominantly white school, it seems to me perfectly natural that you'd want to occasionally (laughs) compare notes with other black students and likewise across the spectrum. But this kind of enforced identity seems to me a strange thing. And if I could just last, I mean, my, my own sons, you know, I mean, I know I've talked a lot about this with them. I mean, your best conversations are when you get together with black and Latino and other friends and you're talking with each other. And that isn't to say this is not a kumbaya moment. These can be, if you will, deep conversations. Again, we're at an interesting moment in American society. Yeah, the distinction to me seems to be, as a philosophical liberal, that obviously individuals should be free to self-assemble in groups, and often they will do that in groups that are structured around the lines of religion or ethnicity, and, you know, that's part of a free society. Now, you know, students aren't entirely adults, but we give them a lot of freedom to decide whether they want to pursue dance or chess in their extracurriculars or their interest groups. And the same way, I'm completely comfortable with the existence of affinity groups in middle schools and high schools in which students can choose to spend time with people of their own ethnic background, of their own cultural background, of their own religious background. That is fine. Where I really start to worry is when this is facilitated in a way that becomes, in effect, mandatory, even if sometimes technically it is not mandatory, by the school. If a school with its authoritative voice tells 16-year-olds or 12-year-olds or sometimes 7-year-olds, the most important thing about you is the color of your skin and off you go into this group to be with people of your kind. That, to me, seems really worrying and counterproductive. Yeah, I mean, well, that crystallizes the question. This is what I wrote about in the piece, was exactly that tension. So that some version of that is, in fact, happening at a sub- substantial number of private elite schools around the country. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I could have as easily written that story in D.C. with a dozen private schools there in San Francisco and Chicago and L.A. Oh, no, this is very much a nationally distributed model of education right now in the privates. Frankly, I think the public's, you know, first place, it's a far vaster landscape. And I think, you know, there it very much goes school to school, district to district across the United States. One of the dimensions of many of these stories that you've reported on and that are in this general area seems to be a sort of hidden class conflict, where, as in the story in Smith College, as in a few other instances, the person who ends up at the receiving end of being fired, of being censored, of being vilified, has in some interesting way a less quote-unquote privileged position. They may be white, but they're working class, or they may be an immigrant, or they may be somebody who doesn't speak English perfectly, or they may be neurodiverse. They are perhaps a little bit on the autism spectrum. Is that something that you sort of see as a pattern? Have you come across that again and again in your reporting, or do you think that's just a few? Oh, no, 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 no. That's a great point, and one that I see repeatedly. And I think, frankly, it plays out in our politics. To cite but one example, if you look at Virginia, if you look at the Rio Grande Valley in 2020, you're seeing working class Latinos behaving in ways that suggest that they are not bought into this aspect of the left liberal project. And I've seen a lot of class resentments. And actually, one of my favorite stories that just I thought it was so interesting, it seemed obscure. There was, you know, Democratic Socialists of America had invited Adolf Reed, a prominent black left scholar uh, taught at the University of Pennsylvania to address them on a lot of these issues, you know, kind of identity. I mean, he's a a Marxist of a non-sectarian sort and very much takes the view that these questions of class are not just urgent, but also urgent in a political, that the only real chance of 
change in society comes when you confuse people of different ethnicities and races and form a coalition and even a cross class coalition. But he's mainly thinking this aspect in class and his talk. This was at the New York Democratic Socialist was canceled by a a number of prominent young socialists who took the view that no race is both the primal divide and the primal organizing aspect for the left. And that to talk about class as kind of challenging the primacy of identity was dangerous and remarkably for a socialist organization, anti-socialist. I say remarkably because, as we know, socialists is predicated on the importance of at least class awareness, if not class primacy. You know, so on the one hand, you could actually, okay, well, that's ESA, you know, America, who pays any attention to that? But I think that these things are very much ground into the view that race and identity are central organizing themes is very much an aspect of today's left liberals. And that plays out in all sorts of ways. And there, I think there's not only an interesting philosophical divide, it holds some electoral peril. Where do you think this cultural moment is leading, which is to say, the country feels very different on many of these issues today than it did 10 years ago. Do you have any sense of where the trend is going? Do you want to hazard any prediction of where we might end up five or 10 years from now? My crystal ball is perpetually cracked. So I don't know, and I'm not simply doing that because I will no doubt if I predict something or forecast something that will prove wrong. I think that one of the things I've been struck by in writing on these subjects, and I've certainly tried to engage with all sides in these disputes. And there is a great reader interest in stories like this. And this is not to throw out my arm patting myself on the back, simply to say, if you write about these subjects, and I know colleagues have had the same experience, you get an enormous response. And I think if you go, say, through the comments on on the pieces, which often run into the thousands, you see people, I think, would be clearly identified as, you know, liberals with a great diversity of opinion on questions that were often told or that where the argument, I should say, is often made that there's really not a lot to discuss here, that this is much as with Dorian Abbott and affirmative action. This is settled. This is bad thought. This is dangerous thought. This puts us at harm. And I think you see, if you look at those comments, a great diversity of thought and, frankly, opposition to the view that this is all settled. And I really suggest that there may be a path to cultural hegemony. It's not a path to political hegemony and can, in fact, prove perilous. You know, but I don't know where that's heading. Michael Powell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Yasha. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Music